Today we've got a great story of convincing somebody to sabotage their own potential profits. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, how I gave my ex something he couldn't get rid of. For as long as I can remember, I've always had the biggest crush on this schoolmate of mine, but never could I have ever imagined that the kind of way that I was feeling for him was way different from how he felt of me. One would think that after the time we spent with each other, things would at least take a turn for the better one way or the other, but when I eventually got to realize how he truly felt of me, and also listening to the particular words he had used, I was completely broken, humiliated, and practically it was at that very moment that I thought to myself that we were truly and obviously over. I guess the next thing at that juncture was to move on from what had just happened, and at least find peace in knowing that for a fact things weren't meant to be between the both of us, but not this time. For this particular time, or rather instance, I was not willing to let up, not one single bit, and I had even sworn to issue the same payback, in the same way I had inadvertently been wronged. I was set out on a personal mission. My story goes way back to when I was still in my late teenage years. I was overly hyper about the fact that I was now legally an adult. Obviously, as this was quite normal for individuals my age at the time, we were still in high school, and the norm back then was to fit in or be left out. And you could tell with certainty that being left out was not a good thing, as there was quite a lot of downsides. First off, there were the kids that were being given the loser, quite literally, every area and aspect of the school's social order, but this wasn't the case for me. I had just turned 18, first off, and I must say, I was the definition of perfect glow up, or rather the perfect transition to adulthood. Right when I was in my penultimate year in high school, I was already receiving countless compliments from various guys, some of which actually caught my fancy until the moment they unintentionally ruined the perfect image I'd built of them inside my head by speaking and acting in an unintellectual manner. I soon realized that things weren't going to be smooth sailing for me, and at some point I'd already given up, as the only thing I wanted at this venture was just to be able to have someone I can call a friend. And then that was when everything practically changed, as there was a new transfer student who had just moved in from a whole different district, and in the middle of the term at that. This was quite unusual, as it was quite known throughout the entire school that this kind of thing usually only happened to special students, or students of special circumstances. And by this kind of thing, I quite literally mean students transferring in at the middle of a school term. Anyways, the student that transferred in was the topic of discussion for quite a while, and this was due to various factors, the most predominant of which were 1. He was a tall Australian native, who was perfect in the aspect of good looks. 2. He had one of the most pleasing accents to listen to, and whenever he spoke, every single person that was around would listen to him, regardless of whether he was speaking to the general public or not. And 3. There were instances where he was placed alongside myself, as people often wondered what kind of a cute couple we would be. I originally wasn't all for those kinds of talks, as even though I was tempted quite a number of times to make my move on him, it just didn't seem appropriate, and I didn't want to come off the same way the other girls had come off, and so I just respected myself and decided to be on my own for the meantime. And one would think that this was going to be enough to allow for things to flow normally, however, it wasn't. I would most likely guess that things escaped quite quickly because of some of the friends he had come to associate himself with, and this is what prompted our first conversation. The time was just a few weeks prior to the winter dance for the seniors, and nearly every single student that was present in the school at the time was out in search of a partner for the dance. It was quite a scene to behold. For wherever you placed your sights, there was always a couple or two in sight who were most definitely being all chummy with each other for the entirety of the school to see for the sake of the winter dance that was coming up in a few weeks. And this was something that was apparently of no concern to me because for one thing, I was particularly uninterested in the dance. Not like I hated or disliked the idea of the dance, but I just didn't fancy the hype behind the dance and the way every other student was making it seem like this was the final event we were going to attend as high school seniors and all. And so, as I was getting proposals from different guys, who were all asking if there was a possibility of them taking me to the dance, and myself being their partner for the dance and all, I outrightly turned every single one of them down, right then and there, on the spot. 
And this wasn't because I didn't like some of the guys that did come to me, but simply because I was uninterested from the get-go, and it didn't seem like any of the guys had noticed this. Then, the one thing I had never imagined, not even in my wildest dreams, had happened. I finally came face to face with the one person I had a silent crush on, let's call him Charlie. Charlie approached me one day, right after school activities were concluded for the day, and he spoke to me in the gentlest and calming manner, almost making me lose my mind and all. He basically told me that he didn't know how he wanted to approach me, but he just decided to go with anything that came to his mind, ergo winging it. The way he approached me, the mannerism in which he spoke to me in fact, quite literally every single thing he said to me right then and there, had captivated me fully. I was already eager to say yes to him, even before he was done speaking and all, but I had to stay composed and focused. I was just looking like I was actually keeping my cool at the time. And when he was done introducing himself and attempting to ask me to the dance, I couldn't take it anymore, and I told him yes right then and there. And it was official. This was the first person I would have ever said yes to, or ever been this eager to say yes to. We exchanged contact information on that day. And for the next few weeks, we were quite literally inseparable. He was perfect. Regardless of the fact that we were complete and total strangers to each other, as at a few days ago, it was almost unbelievable at this point, because we were always together. We had practically grown on each other in the coming weeks, and just as you would expect, the night for the winter dance was already upon us. And this was the night I'd been dreaming of for the past few weeks, if not months. In fact, there was quite literally nothing that was going to dissuade me from rightfully enjoying that night to its fullest. Then, almost randomly, all of a sudden, he popped a question that caught me completely off guard. He actually asked if we could be in a relationship like an actual relationship, together. I was so surprised by what he said that I couldn't answer right then and there. I had to think about it, as everything seemed too good to be true. Naturally, there was no demerit to saying yes in this scenario, but I just didn't feel like I had much of a choice, considering the fact that this was what I'd always wanted and all, but still. It wasn't something I was too keen on saying yes to right then and there on the spot. So I just told him that I would give him a response within the next 24 hours. I don't know why, but this just seemed to tick him off, greatly in fact. And looking back now, I think I get why he felt that way, but I honestly just needed some time to resolve myself so that everything would eventually work out fine for me. But unfortunately for me, I had no idea what he was planning behind my back, as he had already resolved himself to make me apparently pay for rejecting him. Even though I clearly stated that I just needed to think on it and greatly resolve myself, later on, the next day, literally, we met again like we usually did for the past few weeks, if not months, and things were really seeming quite different. And I could already guess why this was the case. It was simply because of the fact that I hadn't given him an answer to what he asked me the day before. And since I'd already decided and made up my mind as it relates to his question, I immediately told him my stance on the question he proposed the day before. And although he showed how excited he was, in all honesty he really didn't seem like it. Anyways, after that day, things between the both of us became really tight, as we were already exploring deep parts of one another. The exploration even got so heated one time during one of our makeouts that things were on the verge of getting physically intense. And I didn't want to make it seem like I didn't want him or anything, and so I just went with the flow when on that very day, I was no longer a virgin. This is where things start to get really interesting. A few days after that lovely moment we shared with each other, his mood had completely changed, and so did his attitude towards me. I didn't know why and just assumed he was going through stuff, but when I got wind of the information that was going around school, that I was as trampy and nasty as they come, there were also private details of myself that I hadn't told or shown anyone that was circulating too. I began to wonder who could have said such a thing about me. I couldn't place it at first, but after spending sleepless nights trying to figure out the source of said information, I finally did. And I was surprised, truly, when I found out that it came from none other than my supposed boyfriend. I was devastated. I didn't even know the next step to take from here, and the only thing on my mind was trying to get why he did what he did. And then, I also got to have a peek on his phone. There was a conversation tagged, The Boys, 
and this was where he told them about the moment we shared and how he had gotten what he wanted from me and also how he was planning on dumping me right after. I lost it right then and there, but I wanted him to feel what I felt at that moment. And so the only thing that came to mind was to give him something that he couldn't rid himself of, an infection. And not just any infection, a terminal one. The process of how I got what I needed is quite long, but the bottom line is, I was able to get it. I got to nick him with the sample I got on me one day while we were hanging out, and that was all it took. I only got to find out a few years later, after we had broken up, that he was seriously ill and needed support for medical bills and all. I just smirked as I knew right then and there that I had succeeded with my payback. Are you telling me that OP just easy eed somebody? I don't know how OP can share a story like that and then gloss over the fact that they got some kind of sample or needle or something that had some kind of terminal illness sample in it and gave it to that guy. If there was ever a detail to elaborate on, is OP like afraid of implicating themselves? That said, our next story is, jerk boss harasses my girlfriend, so I get him fired. There was a time when I, 29 year old male, used to love my job. I'm talking about a time when I'll wake up on a Monday morning with a smile on my face because I was excited to go to work. Okay, that never happened, but you get the idea. Back then, I never felt a sense of dread at the thought of going to work. That was during the time when we had a good head of department, Mike, 49 year old male. Mike was a cool guy. He was the head of the sales department and everyone loved him. He wasn't your typical boss, he was literally one of the guys. He never made us feel inferior because he had a higher position. During lunch breaks, he would sit with us and make jokes. Sometimes he'd even go with us during our coworker hangouts, which we do on Fridays, and we would drink and have a fun time together. He was our friend and the best boss I ever had. But then something happened in the department. The accounting department found out that some money had been going missing over the course of a few months. When they did their investigation, they discovered that some guys in the sales department had been doing some shady deals, and they were promptly arrested and fired. Mike was also fired because he was the head of the department and he hadn't caught wind of that error for so long. After he was fired, the company brought in a guy named Kevin. Kevin, 35-year-old male, was the exact opposite of Mike. He was everything our former boss wasn't. Arrogant, egotistical, and an all-around jerk. He always did everything to remind us that he was the boss. I mean, on the first day he started working with us, he fired our department assistant. He said she wasn't as efficient as he wanted, so she had to go. The next day, he fired William, the office clown, and one of my close work friends. We were having a very boring meeting and William said something to lighten up the mood. Kevin said he spoke out of turn, which was disrespectful to him and the company. This wasn't the first time William would make jokes during meetings. I mean, that was how he earned the title, Office Clown. Within a short period of time, everyone in the office had grown to hate Kelvin. He turned what used to be a fun, lively workspace into a prison where no one wanted to be. In my perspective, I'd say Kelvin was greatly insecure about his position as head of the department, and he felt like he had to do all that to show his power. I guess it'll make him more respected in the office, but instead it just made everyone hate him. I personally didn't have any problems with him. I wasn't the type of person to speak out of turn. I preferred to blend in the background instead of standing out because I don't like being in the spotlight. I also did my work on time and made sure to be as efficient as possible so he wouldn't have problems with me. But blending into the background only worked for so long. On the day of the company's 15th anniversary, we had a party in the CEO's mansion. The invite said we could bring a plus one, so I decided to invite my new girlfriend, Penny, 25-year-old female. I'd have been talking to my coworkers and friends about her, so I decided that the party was the best time to let them meet her officially. When we got to the party, I introduced her to my friends, and after talking for a while, I excused myself to go get a drink for both of us. I wasn't gone for up to five minutes, but by the time I got back, my friends were no longer with Penny. Instead, she was in the company of Kelvin. From afar, I could tell that she was uncomfortable, and so I walked over to meet her. I asked if everything was okay. Kelvin looked at me for a moment and asked who I was. This was the man I'd been working under for the past three months. 
That's one of the downsides of blending in, I guess. I introduced myself and he laughed, saying he didn't recognize me. He made a comment about me not standing out and even though it was meant as an insult, I decided to let it slide. I passed one of the champagne glasses to Penny and I tried to excuse ourselves from Kelvin, but he asked what the rush was. Then he asked me to get him a glass of champagne since he was still getting to know Penny. I refused and pointed to where he could get a glass for himself. I did this as politely as I could, but he still took offense. He accused me of undermining him and said he could fire me, but I immediately told him that we weren't at work, so I could refuse his request. Besides, the work description never said that I had to get him drinks at parties. He was still fuming when I left his site. Penny asked if it was smart to infuriate him that way but I told her not to worry about it. I could do anything to stay in the background and away from his sight, but I'll never allow him to harass my girl. Not in my presence. Anyways, I soon learned that Kelvin didn't take my refusal to get him a drink lightly. The next day, he came into my office and looked around till he set his eyes on me. He dropped a heap of files on my desk and told me to attend to them before the day's end. This was the type of job that he would share with four people. And even then, it's almost impossible to look through all those reports and properly work on them before the day's end. I knew he was trying to punish me, so I decided that I wouldn't give him the satisfaction of seeing me break. Besides, I'd cleared out my task for the day the previous day, which was Sunday, so I could spend all my time on the report documents he gave to me. By the end of the day, I was done with 70% of them. I went over to submit them and told him that I would do the rest the next day, but he refused. He made some flimsy excuses about needing the report that day and that I should spend the entire night working on it if I had to, but I should make sure I finished it. I expected that already, and that was why I had my phone on record before I went into his office. I pleaded with him that I had to go home because I had a medical condition and I left my pills at home. He said he didn't care and that if I couldn't finish the job that night, I was fired. I decided to stay back and some of my friends also decided to join in and help me finish. Within an hour, we were done. That wasn't the only time Kelvin bullied me because of our altercation at the party. Sometimes he'd resort to sending me on errands meant for the office assistants. I didn't complain, as long as it was during my work hours. This went on for some time, and I'd already gotten used to his antics. But one day, Kelvin decided to step out of line. The day before this fateful day, I got home late because I encountered a little traffic on the way home. So I got to bed late and woke up late. I rushed to prepare for work, and when I got in my car and drove to work, I realized that I forgot my lunch on the kitchen counter. I couldn't go back for it because I was already late and I was trying to avoid being more late. Anyway, I got to work, and Kelvin had a field day ranting at me about not taking my job seriously. He even threatened to fire me, but he decided to pardon me. He couldn't fire me because if he did, his revenge would be over, and he'd have to find a new person to pick on, which could be very tiring. Anyways, as usual, he gave me a bunch of work to do, and after a few hours of being buried with work, one of my coworkers called me and told me that Penny was looking for me. She had texted me earlier about forgetting my lunch, and even though I told her not to bother bringing it, she did. I left my table to go look for her. When I stepped into the hallway, I saw her walking toward me with fire in her eyes. At first, I thought I'd done something wrong, but when she got close to me, she told me my boss, Kelvin, harassed her. I was taken aback. I asked her what she meant, and she told me that when she walked into the office, she saw him and he stretched out his hand to shake her. When she took his hand to shake him, he pulled her in and hugged her. But it wasn't just an ordinary hug. He pressed her chest against him, and his hand brushed against her butt more than once. She tried to pull away, but he didn't let her. I told her to show me where it happened, and when she did, I realized that it was the one blind spot that the office floor had. I was so pissed that I wanted to confront him immediately, but I knew it wasn't smart. He would just deny it and since there was no evidence, nothing would be done. So I decided to make a better plan. I had been recording all the times Kelvin had been mistreating me, but I didn't think it was enough. So I decided to push him to do something stupid. In the few months I've known him, I knew how fragile his ego is and I was sure he would react if his ego is bruised. So the next week, during our strategy meeting, he made a suggestion on how to drive sales for the next quarter and I opposed him. I made his idea sound stupid. 
I'd already told my coworkers my plan, and so I told them to laugh when I undermined his idea. When they did, he got so furious that he walked over to me, grabbed me by the shirt, and pushed me to the ground. I fell and faked an injury. I made it seem so serious that I had to be helped out of the meeting room. I went straight to HR and made my complaint. My case went straight to the disciplinary board and I told them all that had been happening. I gave them all the recordings I'd made and when they listened to it, they called in Kelvin. Of course, he denied ever mistreating me, but then they called in 10 of my coworkers to testify. They all said the same thing, that he was a toxic boss and a bully and he had gotten physical with me on different occasions. After hearing all that, they decided I was telling the truth and they put Kelvin on an indefinite leave. After a month or so, they fired him and brought in a new sales head. We all celebrated when we heard that he'd been fired. It was a joyful moment for the entire department. I'm just confused why this guy was put on an indefinite suspension for over a month. I'm hoping it was more for just until they could find somebody to replace them and not a let's scour to try to find if there's any way we can salvage this and still retain this guy. That said, our next story is, I convinced a client not to show her work at my boss's art gallery. One morning, I woke up early, dressed up nicely, and left for the airport. I had registered my car with Uber the year before, but I hardly ever had any time to work my driving job. On that day, I dusted my ID and got to work. I knew about the woman I wanted to give a ride to. I had read extensively about her and I knew she was more likely to use the services of a young female driver. Let's call this woman Mrs. P. I parked at the airport, hoping that day was my lucky day and that somehow the person I was looking for finds me. Fortune smiled at me when after two hours of being at the airport, my phone beeped. It was her assistant trying to book a ride. I quickly accepted the ride before any of the other drivers at the airport beat me to it and drove to the side of the airport they were in. One thing I learned from my online customer service course is this. An okay service will not get you noticed, but an excellent service will ensure that your client never forgets you. I decided to do what I'd always done, provide excellent service. When Mrs. P and her assistant spotted my car, I immediately got out to help with the heavy luggage they had with them. I'm quite small, so it was a funny sight seeing me trying to carry the heavy luggage into the trunk of my car. Mrs. P was amused, but from her expression, I could tell that she was impressed that I could carry that luggage. Then it was time to carry the last piece. The reason I was there, a large piece of art belonging to Mrs. P's late cousin. Careful dear, it is fragile, she said as I lifted it. Her assistant helped me. We got into the car and I began the ride. While in the car, I heard her assistant berate her for not letting any of the art curators they'd spoken to pick them up from the airport. She said she knew they would have a special vehicle for moving artworks, and expressed her worry that the artwork in my trunk would be destroyed in the process of transporting it from one place to the other. I smiled sweetly and assured her that nothing of the sort would happen. My trunk was safe and clean. I then asked her if she would be needing a driver all through her stay in the city, and offered to drive her around whenever she needed me. She thanked me and asked her assistant to take my number. When I took her to her hotel, and she tipped me heavily, I knew I'd made a good first impression. I could have chipped in that I knew about art or asked about the artwork sitting in my trunk, but I didn't want my little pre-planned event to seem planned. I either got lucky again or made a great first impression the next day because her assistant called me that evening to ask if I'll be available to drive her boss to an art gallery the next day. I told her I would be available. The next morning I got dressed in my office attire. I worked at an art gallery and my boss was very specific about us looking good. I also took care to do my makeup properly and make sure it flattered my face. When I went to pick her up, Mrs. P looked pleasantly surprised by how good I looked. She asked what the occasion was, and I told her it was just my regular job. Her assistant eyed me curiously and asked what my regular job was. When I told them I worked in an art gallery, they asked which one, and then they both exchanged glances. Mrs. P then mentioned that she was going to be showing her cousin's art in our gallery later that month. I pretended to be surprised, but I already knew of course. She then complimented how good I looked, and we talked a bit about art and her late cousin who was the creator of the artifacts she would be showing in our gallery. I dropped her off at the art gallery she was going to and drove away. 
After driving Mrs. P and her assistant to the gallery, I went back to my job where my boss hadn't paid me for three months. She'd traveled briefly to a new country, and that was the only reason I had free time on my hands to drive Mrs. P around. My boss was a self-absorbed woman. She was only concerned about her success and looking good. She never just did anything nice for anyone. Whatever she did was to make her look better or to promote her image. She was also, for very strange reasons, jealous of all the women who worked for her. And for some even stranger reason, she was meaner to me than she was to the other ladies at work. She gave me so much work that many times I'd have to take my work home. My ex used to be very confused about what exactly I did for a living. He didn't understand why working in an art gallery had to be that demanding. I tolerated my boss for a very long time because I wanted to become a curator in the future too. I enjoyed being around art. I always have. When I got the job there, I was excited. I was just certain that I had gotten the job that would change my life forever. My boss's studio was a reputable one and everyone knew she was a smart woman who knew her business. However, after my first interview with her, it was almost as though she hated me yet loved me. She wanted me to come and work for her because she valued my intelligence, but she also seemed to be intimidated by me or just annoyed that someone else was good at what she did. I resumed work at the office and I've been miserable ever since. My boss yells at everyone at work, she yells at me even more. She criticizes my work clothes all the time even though I'm the kind of girl to dress nicely and wear heels. She just had a problem with whatever I wore. At first, I was terrified of my boss. I feared her criticism and loud voice, but I soon understood that she was that way because she felt small around me and was trying to compensate for that. At first, I felt ridiculous for even thinking that, but it became very obvious. After my boss, I was the one who was most knowledgeable about art at work, yet she never promoted me. She kept me close enough to use my ideas and knowledge, but she never promoted me or gave me a raise. I worked very hard at work, but she never acknowledged my contributions. The more valuable my contributions were, the more she resented me. The last straw that broke the camel's back was how she treated me when I fell while carrying a molded pot in the gallery. She had told the gallery staff that the gallery needed an uplift and asked us to get rid of some art pieces and replace them with new collections. The pot was one of those pieces. Usually, we save the old ones in the store and bring them out during auction sales, or they could come back in style and we put them back on display. But my boss thought that that pot was uninteresting and wanted to get rid of it. She even told her assistant that she was willing to sell it for a cent just to get rid of it. While I was carrying the pot down the stairs, I heard her yell my name, so I panicked and fell. The pot fell too, and it chipped a bit at the top. My boss was mad. She told me the pot was worth five months of my salary, even when I'd just heard her talk about how she was willing to sell it for literally any amount. I thought she was bluffing until my paycheck didn't come in for the first month. I was frustrated, but I decided I would work hard and earn from the sales commission then. That was going fine for me, until I learned that my boss had sold the pot. Not only did she sell the pot for a good price, but one of the reasons the buyer was so interested in the pot was because of the chip at the top. Yet my boss kept this to herself and deducted my salary for that month. That was when I told myself that I was going to get back at her in a big way. I contacted another gallery and told them I could help them become the major art gallery in the city. And they asked what I could do. I started to tell buyers to check their gallery, but I was very careful about it. I was getting commissions for sales I made at another gallery while in the gallery I worked at. When I found out that Mrs. P wanted to show her late cousin's art exclusively at our gallery, I decided that I was going to get her to change her mind. One, to get revenge on my boss. Losing Mrs. P was going to be a huge loss for her and the gallery, especially since she had bragged to everyone that Mrs. P had agreed to an exclusive, and the art was highly sought after. Secondly, I didn't even think my boss was so passionate about art. She knew her art well enough to slap a price on them, but she was really all about money. For a week, I drove Mrs. P around the city. We talked about art, culture, and work. It was nice. 
She told me about her late cousin and how he had a stroke at a very young age. She also talked about how, despite his illness, he still painted. We talked about how some people are all just about the money and not the message that art passes, and I told her that my boss was one of such people. She nodded and said that she'd noticed that my boss had a cold stare. I told her I understood what she meant, and left what I'd said to marinate. One evening, Mrs. P asked me to drive her around the city again, and I obliged her. She asked if she could ask an honest question, and I told her she could. She asked if I thought the gallery I worked at was a good place to show her late cousin's art. She said his ghost would haunt her forever if she sold his work to someone who just wanted to make a business transaction. We had a long conversation about it, and I convinced her to use the other gallery I had been secretly working for. When my boss returned and found out that Mrs. P was no longer interested in showing her cousin's art at the gallery, she was upset. She flipped and got mad. Mrs. P even told me that my boss had threatened to sue her. But of course, that wasn't possible, seeing as no formal contract had been made, and Mrs. P sponsored her trip to the city. The curators at the other gallery were so impressed with my hard work that they offered me a significant position in their gallery, and I took it. My former co-workers told me that my boss went red when she found out about what I'd done, but it was too late, and I stopped caring about how she felt. I mean, I'm willing to bet that OP stopped caring how their boss felt a while back. I mean, to go behind their back and start getting clients to the other gallery, let alone the fact that the boss was doing something clearly that had to have been illegal by holding those checks back. Trying to get away with not paying OP for, what, five months makes it pretty easy to start selling clients to a different place. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.